the objectives are uh, we'll try and describe major research areas very broad uh, framework of what are the areas so that one can identify what are you passionate about we will identify pragmatic areas also based on what setting one is because that is more important i mean there are so many questions to be answered but then what can one answer given the limitations of the setting that they are in and then we'll identify what are the challenges when one thinks to you know take forward a project which has which is be, which is a research project in addiction psychiatry so i'm not following any uh, traditional typology because i find this division to be most intuitive uh, so one of the areas is epidemiology we all know right from mbbs epidemiology is asking questions like what so what substances are being used who are the people how do we describe the people who are using it how are they using it so what's the route what is the circumstance when are they using it uh, where are they using it and ultimately why are they using it and what are the consequences so any research that answers any of these questions is ultimately epidemiological research there is neurobiology research which i am not covering in detail and the reason for that is uh, our the ones that i have mentioned here it requires very advanced techniques of interrogation for example mri i would just touch on it but not go in details increasingly we have realized that doing this research in small uh, groups makes no sense for example if you look at how the genetics or the genetic findings have changed uh, initially there was a lot of boom of you know this gene is important that gene is important and eventually now if you talk about impl implying any gene in any disorder the evidence that is believed is jivas now jivas can't be done by a person or even by a team it's invariably a consortium so it's a completely different ball game and um, you know i believe it belongs more to people who are career researchers so there is this concept of career diplomats and career um, uh, administrators similarly there are career researchers people who have dedicated most of their working time to research itself and because neurobiological research is very complicated requires a lot of expertise uh, those are the people with whom uh, who generate most of the output and for a clinician scientist it may not be very easy to match it unless you are in a tertiary center where you don't have very many uh, clinical responsibility there's of course treatment outcome research and there is a there is a mixed bag of something i call side streams what i mean by side streams is uh, and this is not i mean i don't mean to disparage any kind of research by calling it a side stream what i am saying is uh, you don't have to be an addiction psychiatry expert to do this research for example you will see multiple publications on policy directions who's new list of essential medicines is diazepam there or not and that yielding a publication now in my humble opinion you don't really have to be an addiction scholar to do this uh, anybody who is a doctor or who has interest in policy can do this uh, counting the number of advertisements during ipl where alcohol was advertised in a surrogate manner now that is an example of something that you don't have to be an addiction researcher to do it uh, that's anybody can do it similarly societal attitudes etc are side streams or maybe training what is the best way of training the pedagogy is a branch unto itself there's a, there's so much research for example the uh, learning objectives the the way you are supposed to frame them is coming from bloom's taxonomy that's all from research but my whole point is it's not necessary addiction psychiatry research it is research peripherally related to addiction psychiatry but let me tell you at this point itself uh, these are the low hanging fruits with no uh, i mean with no my aim right now i'm what i'm telling you is how to get published how to get funded that's my aim right now i'm not getting into what is worthwhile so these side streams are actually the easiest and therefore most often used so do go in that arena as well so let's look at major research areas epidemiology i think it is the specialty of substance use area where what substances are being used is unto itself a large area of research for example it could be a very big survey research that just like the national drug use survey of 2019 but then you do realize that such kind of survey research requires a lot of uh, uh, you know resources and coordination or it could be smaller reports 
very many of them from treatment centers. For example, dams. Uh, uh, so uh, dams used to be an instrument which was used across centers for a fairly long time that used to capture what are people using. And time to time analysis of uh, the, dams out, the, the dams output would give you an idea of what's being used across the country. If you follow any of the big names in addiction psychiatry in India, uh, including from Nimans, you will see most of them start their careers from retrospective uh, reports of what is the prevalence of X in Y group. So it's a good, nice starting point. There are some upcoming areas analysis where water is collected from uh, sewage treatment plants and you detect how much, how many, so what all, and what is the concentration of various metabolites of drug abuse. And then you can relate it back to how many people might be using it. That's a new area. You don't even need human beings to understand is some new drug coming up. For example, analyzing contents on chat uh, boards, dark web analysis where it is seen what is the street price of something which is being smuggled. Those could be sources of finding out what substances are popular these days. And we have emergency rooms, early warning systems. Uh, so, for example, if the emergency room follows a particular data entry uh, system, they can tell, you know, how many uh, head injuries with alcohol being in, uh, involved, how many opioid overdoses, so on and so forth. The last three are uh, rather um, new uh, and less uh, used. I'll just give you an example. This is something that Deepto did. Uh, my whole point of giving this example is to is to motivate you. See, purely speaking, for a prevalence study, unless it is community-based, we believe it is not worth doing. But that's not true. But that is not true because community-based studies can only be done, say, at max once in a decade. For example, the 2019 study has happened after Dr. Ray's work, and there have been so many decades in between. So you don't get that kind of funding. Then how do you generate data about what new substances are appearing? You generate it based on what you're seeing in your own uh, outpatient and inpatient departments. So uh, Deepto, while uh, he was with us here, uh, published about a molecule called tepentadol. I'm sure all of you already know this. But then when we did publish it, it was the first report to actually report uh, to first uh, publication to report large scale diversion and abuse. We also use data from Internet. We saw how many people are searching for the word Tidal and Tepentadol. And that was another added part of this. So used a number of different ways coming to other kinds of questions. So the same idea, the same Tepentadol, uh, who are these users? What are their characteristics? When and where do they use it? And what are the consequences? So uh, one of my uh, 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 colleagues, uh, Prakriti, has recently published in IGMR uh, about hepatitis C in these patients. What are their characteristics? You know, are, uh, What kind of socioeconomic status do they come from? Another new thing that we used was we had their addresses. So we saw if they're clustering. Are they living near each other, especially if they're hepatitis positive? So that gives you an idea of, you know, uh, are these uh, small groups that are having a lot of needle exchange? So I, the examples I have put here are especially examples which are kind of opportunistic publishing. For example, uh, Dr. Narsimha, who was also a senior resident, now a faculty with us, um, published a report in Alco Alco at the time of COVID-19 when we were seeing a lot of uh, delirium tremens cases. And um, I remember Professor Prabhat had sent me an email uh, from Alco Alco editor because it was the most cited paper in that particular year. Now, if you ask me, was this a very well-planned, you know, a methodologically very rigorous study? Did we have pilot studies before it? None of it, nothing. It was just the novelty and the opportunistic style with which we could get it out that it has lifted all our H indexes, to be frank. Then we also looked at traumatic brain injury during COVID-19. This is an example of passive data where number of uh, head injuries were tabulated in our emergency and we saw, did it change when alcohol was banned? So again, it not a very particular study. With that, will I make a claim that alcohol contributes to 90% of head injuries? No, I cannot make that claim. It was not methodologically good enough. But is it enough? Is it worthwhile evidence to get published and to draw attention? Well, it definitely was and it did get published. Coming to the second area, neurobiology, very, very briefly, I've already told that, you know, at least, I mean, I, let me be frank with you. 
it is beyond me for as of today it is beyond me in all honesty to design a protocol to analyze the data to make sense of it and to publish it i will have to take a leave of one week and you know brush up all my concepts because i have done it in md uh, thesis so you can interrogate brain by various ways if you just want to interrogate anatomy you'd be using mri which itself is of two varieties uh, one is structural and uh, another is that is also structural but that specifically looks at connectivity and the white matter you could look at the functioning and you could look at it with mri you could look at it uh, with fnirs and jayanth is, has worked a lot has worked in on fnirs you could uh, use pet or spec so the whole point being very exotic techniques fairly exotic techniques and the proper way to do them would probably be to go to a center and get trained in doing them of course for every thing there is a proper and an improper way so the improper way would be to just go ahead and do it and i mean uh, send your data to somebody else who can analyze it and you can draft the results but by and large fairly intensive areas that require a lot of training let's look at the third that is treatment outcome research and in this what i want you to remember is um, there is a hierarchy of evidence when you talk of treatment outcome and we know an old hierarchy that says systematic review and meta analysis are at the top followed by randomized control trials followed by cohort studies case control studies case series and reports uh, there is a new modification uh, suggested to it where it is said that you know systematic review and meta analysis should be disengaged from this and the reason for that is uh, i mean there are dime a dozen if you actually search anything today uh, it is almost an industry to do systematic review and meta analysis now the point is systematic review and meta analysis is ultimately analysis of what has already been done so if in a field not enough good quality work has been done you can get a publication by i mean it's garbage in garbage out so you ingest the garbage of low quality studies and you generate a low quality systematic review and everybody is happy but then uh, that's why it's been said that you know we need to look at it more carefully and so the real top is randomized control trials i'll tell you why it's important doing an rct is very difficult it requires funding now the funding can come from the sponsor of the molecule then it all gets stuck in your respective ethics committees you know and it requires blinding it requires a clinical research organization that can coordinate all the randomization etc cetera, etc cetera. so and the the flip side of it in is in epidemiology i can get away with weaker evidence but if i have to make a claim that gabapentin at 1200 mg works wonderfully for alcohol dependence in indian population nobody will publish that claim or take that paper seriously unless i have done a uh, at least a fairly good sized rct less than that is not going to cut it you will do a lot of hard work but then you'll find it difficult to get it published and accepted you know in in the kind of journals that that are worthwhile publishing in so that is a rider that i have about treatment outcome research but then ultimately it is one of the research uh, one of the areas of research that has very immediate effects on what we do day to day so that is true but then yes there are difficult coming to the second last part of uh, my presentation so you know how do we decide the pragmatic areas uh, what are the questions that we must try and answer i think the most important question is what are you passionate about see because you can research an area to make a md thesis or a dm thesis you can take it as a punishment as a task and get it done but then if you want to take up something that you will pursue step by step for the better part of your professional life you have to feel something about it for example i mean again um, with no disparagement to anybody i believe i cannot do research on psychological therapies i don't feel passionate about them it's not that i don't think they are not worth studying i believe they are worth studying they are very difficult to study they are very important i just don't personally feel passionate about it so i think one of the first things is to ask yourself what are you most passionate about amongst the broad areas how many patients do you have access to if the number is not big enough you may want to look at side streams or other sources of data which are openly available for example you can take up nfhs surveys across the um, uh, waves and see uh, can you make a hypothesis around you know the district from which the data is coming the socio economic status of people there 
and whatever substances, alcohol that you're interested in. Okay, so that's that's another thing you would want to ask yourself. How much data can you actually collect actively and passively? What I mean is, do you have people who can collect data who you employ only for collecting data to answer your research question? Or do you have a data capture system and electronic health records or even a pen and paper health records which are filled very religiously with good quality data. That's the passive data. So that's another question you need to ask yourself before you decide what you want. Can you do a particular research? How much expertise do you have? So it's quite possible that you don't have expertise in statistics. You need not have very good expertise in statistics. You can always uh, you know, collaborate with somebody who has it. But then do you at least have a baseline expertise to form a research question? to understand how things need to be done. Data analysis, you can get it done by paying somebody. But then to form the research hypothesis, that is something you will have to do yourself. How much energy do you have? Because in mostly it is work done out of your own curiosity, your own time and your own effort. We do not have a system where you know people are paid for publications or paid for new discoveries, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, unless you can hold a patent. Um, so that's another question that you must ask yourself. How are you placed right now? What is happening in personal life, professional life? And do you really have the energy and the bandwidth for this? What collaborations can you achieve uh, at your center if there are other departments or with other centers? Increasingly, I am coming to believe that success in research is a function of how many collaborations you have rather than your individual genius and brilliance. Can you hitch a ride on one of the bandwagons? What I mean is a bandwagon is something, you know, it's a wave. It's a wave. Does your research interest uh, align with one of the bandwagons? For example, does your research align with technology enabled solutions? That's the latest bandwagon. Uh, this, I think we are of course using technology right now, even for this class, for this um, discussion. So, you know, any protocol that has the word technology, AI, machine learning, remote, tele, I mean, these are the words that that sound good to people who are funding it. And so does your research interest align with it? So that's another question you might ask. And again, just take up any established researcher and see their trajectory. I'm talking of people who have not dedicated their life to neurobiological research. And you will see slowly everybody drifting to one or the other wave. That wave might be the NCD, non-communicable disease wave. It may be the tobacco wave. It may be the technology wave. It may be the alternative medicine wave. But then that is the power of waves. And if your research interest aligns with it, um, I see nothing too wrong uh, in hitching a ride with one of these bandwagons. The big if is if your research interest aligns with it, just doing it because right now it's easy to get funding in that. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how well that works. Out. Exploring possible resources. So the good news is, NCDs, non-communicable diseases, are priority areas of most funding agencies. Uh, so if you look at the recent ICMR call, I, I, the NCDs were marked as a priority area. Now, how you package your idea as an NCD is the, is the crux of it. Because if you look at it, treatment, you want if you want to uh, write a protocol on uh, treatment of delirium tremens, and you try to sell it as an NCD, you will find it very difficult. Whereas on the other hand, if you are in one of the AIMS or some other medical college that also has a pulmonology department and you look at a brief intervention for tobacco cessation, that looks very close to NCD. So that's what I mean, that although there is a focus on NCD, you have to think, can your idea go that way? As I have already discussed, bandwagons are much easier to get funded. Uh, tobacco technology enabled, I have already discussed this, complementary and alternative medicine, uh, in fact, there's much more budget for research if you look at, at it as a percentage uh, under the Ayush ministry than actually the ICMR's whole budget. So, you know, if your research interest aligns with it, there is no harm in tapping that source. Side streams may not require any patient data. So, for example, looking at alcohol sales, looking at, you know, pre-post of, for example, I'm sure a pre-post test would be done in this particular course that we are attending, all of us are attending right now. 
and uh, so you can get that published pretty easily uh, without having to you know uh, look at patient data and patient data is messy patient data is difficult to get teams working in big centers are usually eager to collaborate i'll tell you why uh, everybody is making an app but to really sell it you have to show it works across cultures so uh, i'm sure an american or a or a britisher would be happy to have their app tested on your patients uh, we can talk about the ethics of it uh, later on but then you will definitely become an author in in that paper whenever it comes out so do seek out collaborations they are easier than they seem to be uh, then they seem when we don't send that first email so just sending the first email is probably the biggest uh, hurdle sadly enough novelty triumphs methodological rigor or expertise if what you are trying to study is new if it is catchy it's more likely to get funded so you can have a flexible style um, of working where you have your passion is something which is not new but then probably the techniques or the way that you are trying to study it for example if my passion is medical complications of alcohol use disorder i can at least use a new technique like fibro scan to study it now that fibro scan becomes the catchy part of it otherwise alcohol causes liver cirrhosis and liver cirrhosis causes death is an old story nobody wants to fund it so what i'm saying is novelty is a, is a very important part if you're looking out for funding what are the challenges there are challenges which are common with any other research that and the first one is good research in my mind cannot be done for free it just cannot be done for free any research that comes out for free is either completely insignificant or highly suspect so if an md student comes and says they have done 100 qualitative interviews i'd be very very worried about the 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 quality of that so good research comes only through money and collaborations good research usually requires longitudinal design it's impossible to answer important questions in just one shot survey and good research is always slow and incremental so instead of clubbing everything in a single uh, protocol you know we'll do the fibro scan we'll describe how sick they are we will also find out genetics behind this and we will also solve the problem by giving them a medicine that's what we try to do when we write a protocol because we want to make sure it gets funded but the fact is you first do the fibro scan and see how many of them are sick then you see how are their genes different from people who are not sick then you see how do you treat them these are three separate studies specific to addiction psychiatry outcomes are very difficult to define time to first drink versus time to lapse versus time to heavy drinking time to relapse number of days of heavy drinking quality of life these are all outcomes of a trial that is looking at a new intervention for alcohol dependence so you know we that that kind of creates a problem which outcome to use most effective interventions are fairly difficult to sell up under for example recent research is showing that as a preventive measure for new onset substance use disorder direct cash transfer to poor families is the most effective intervention now try selling it to icmr try selling it to a funder saying that you know i want to study if i transfer 5000 rupees to the mother's account of uh, uh kids of alcoholics from uh, from bpl um and then follow them up for next 15 years i and my hypothesis is that with direct cash transfer uh less kids will develop uh, alcoholism or alcohol dependence i think you are going to find it very difficult to get this funded uh it's difficult to collect reliable data so self report is usually considered to be slightly problematic in uh, in in addiction research and therefore you have to collect you know objective markers for example urine tests or blood tests and not these tests are not as easily available as say serum electrolytes so that becomes a limitation i believe there are also attitudinal barriers from policy makers for example when we apply to icmr icmr is looking at proposals that are talking of you know early detection of cataract prevention of congenital abnormalities and then there is our protocol which is talking about improving nutrition in people with alcohol dependence who don't want to abstain let's say we are putting across a proposal of looking at harm reduction in alcohol dependence i think you can imagine you can imagine uh, somewhere down the line 
it's not only the methodological rigor, but then also the preconceived notions about substance use that would come into play. And therefore, a research looking at anemia in pregnancy versus a research looking at effectiveness of naltrexone in decreasing heavy drinking in alcoholics, I think the first one is more likely to get funded. So those are some of the challenges that we face. And I hope I have not exceeded my time limit too much. Thanks a lot.